And hello, everyone. Glad to have everyone here in the wonderful exhibition kitchen, but done virtually as we are doing this season of our lives. Um, we are so excited to have you here and so excited to welcome our author this afternoon, this, well, yeah, this afternoon. Um, before we do that as well, we will be handing out some books as well um, of our lovely author, some lovely giveaways. If you could at this moment, place your email into the chat just so that we can collect them. We will be reaching out once the books have arrived on campus. Campus. And then we will send them, um, we'll have them, you all pick them up at the bookstore, our lovely winners for when, when we do get them on campus. Of course, the snowstorm has delayed a little bit. <laughs> so again, let's go back to our wonderful author this afternoon. Her name is Susan Herman Loomis. She's an award-winning author with 14 books to her credit and has contributed to numerous publications, including Bon Appetit, Cooking Light, and the New York Times. So of course, you know, just a few things that we all might have heard of. Um, she's originally from the Pacific Northwest and moved to France in the 1980s to study cooking and is since opened a French cooking school, which uh, I will hand over to her to talk more about. Um, but please let us all welcome Susan and here we go. Hi, Susan, can you hear us? I could not, but I oh. did see you just now. Oh, perfect. Okay. So, Susan, could you introduce us a little bit to yourself and your book that you were sending us our we're at, enjoying um, this afternoon? I'd be happy to. I, um, I have a degree in journalism, and as I began my journalistic career, I was spending a lot of time reading about food and travel and realized that I could do, I could write about those subjects. So before I wanted to specialize in food, particularly, I want to learn, really learn how to cook. So I became an apprentice at a cooking school in Paris. And I worked there for a year and then I stayed in Paris and taught and cooked in a little restaurant and did various food things and um, moved back to the US after four years living in Paris and wrote my first book, which is called The Great American Seafood Cookbook. And that came out in 1983, I think. So um, there were books printed at that time. It's not that long ago. But since then, I, I lived in the US for 10 years in, in Seattle, where I'm from the Pacific Northwest, moved to New York, then to Maine, where I did and did books the whole time, and then moved back to France in 1993. And I've been working from here ever since. And I've written French farmhouse, Italian farmhouse, American farmhouse, very dedicated to making the link between the producer and the consumer. So. One of my favorite jobs is to go interview farmers and find out what they're thinking about while they're working and what kind of food are they eating. And for this book, which is called Plat du Jour and it's got lots of little post-its in it, um, I, it's very linked to the farmers and the soil because so many of the dishes that we eat in French cuisine, whether it be three star or just what's eaten in the home, has its origins in the fabulous seasonal local ingredients which spring from the soil. So all my experience in France has kind of led me to this book because I wanted to do a book that gathered the dishes of the day that one finds in French restaurants. And plat du jour means dish of the day. So every day the recipes are different, the dishes are different at a restaurant because a restaurateur knows they need to attract the same clients day after day. So they go to the market, they find what's seasonal, preferably what's local, and that's how they build the dish of the day. And they include it in a menu that's called formule, we would call it a formula, and that includes the dish of the day and either a first course or a dessert and sometimes both. And the price is always right, the food is always great, and it's always directly linked to the season, which gives people immense comfort. So that's the basis of the, plat, the book Plat du Jour. And in addition to that, I've taught um, the history of French gastronomy to uh, college level students. So there is a lot of historical information in the book because once you start cooking and studying cuisine, you realize everything has a story behind it. Everything might be a leak, you know, the thing about leeks, the story about leeks is there's a saying that says, don't 
don't wait around, but they say it, il faut pas poireauter. Poireau is leak, so don't leak around, but it means don't wait around. Uh, there are all kinds of things like that. So it's so much fun to study the history of French gastronomy and come up with all these little tidbits of information. That's wonderful. Um, I'm I, as long as uh, as well as I know a bunch of our viewers are very excited to hear you speak French. It's such a lovely language and it's so connected with with um, dining. And could you tell us a little bit of how your book is actually sequenced? You said it does a lot of front table as well as like dishes of the day. So um, could you tell us a little bit more of how you pair that? Absolutely. The thing about the dish of the day, some of these recipes could be either a first course or a dish of the day because a French meal, there's a protocol. It's very strict. So you begin with an appetizer and I have a whole list of appetizers in here from sauteed shiitake mushrooms to fresh spring radishes served with butter, fleur de sel and baguette. That's a huge uh, appetizer or amuse-gueule, amuse-bouche or amuse-gueule means to amuse the mouth. So what you always want to do is keep people happy while they're waiting for their first course. So after the amuse bouche comes the first course, it's called an entree in France. We mix it up in the US, we call the main course an entree, but entree means to begin to enter. So the first course is the entrance. So I have many dishes like, it's a fabulous one where you toast bread, you put pancetta on it, you saute chicken livers, and then you put a wonderful caper sauce on top and that works as a first course or as a main dish. So then you go to the main dishes and there are things like one of the things the chef Tom is gonna to demonstrate for you today called fish and the virgin sauce. And um, there's some history about that sauce that we'll talk about during the demo. And that's a simple piece of fish with a gorgeous sauce on it. That's a plat du jour. And a plat du jour doesn't always have an accompaniment but I do have a whole chapter of accompaniments in case you wanted to oven roast some potatoes with that or um, cook some broccoli or do something like that and serve it with the fish. It would be on a different plate though, because if you can see the picture here, I'm gonna show you that you eat with your eyes as much as you eat with your palate. So you wanna make every dish that you make very appetizing. So after that comes the cheese course. After the main course comes the salad and the cheese they can sometimes be combined. And then after that, you finally make your way to dessert. So a French meal is at minimum three courses, at maximum, it can go on forever. And who doesn't want that wonderful food to go on forever? That's just my, my take on that. <laughs> and, so, and the other goal I had with this book is, I my goal is to get people into the kitchen. So the recipes are clear, they're simple, sometimes they take time, but the time is them cooking. So the prep time, everything is noted so that you see what, how much time a recipe is going to take. But this fish in the virgin sauce, it takes 20 minutes. I mean, it takes 20 minutes to prepare and five minutes to cook it. So you're not embarking on anything complicated, but you are embarking on an incredible voyage of discovery that results in the most delicious food. Susan, that is wonderful. And that just, oh, then I'm so excited to start these own recipes for myself in my own house. I'm also so excited now that you've beautifully introed it. I'm going to throw this over to Tom as well, and Tom and yourself, and for you to enjoy a little conversation as he makes your wonderful dishes. So here we go. Thank you so much. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in to us today. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to start with the, uh, the fish dish. Um, that we spoke about a little bit earlier. We're gonna be using some fresh uh, local pollock. This fish was swimming about a day and a half ago. Um, it's uh, very fresh and really lends itself well um, to a recipe like this. So what we're gonna do first is actually, we're gonna, the, 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 um, the fish really, it, we're gonna steam it, but we're gonna steam it in sort of a little bit of an interesting way. So I've got my kind of steamer set up here. So what, what I'm gonna do first is actually slice uh, some potatoes. I've got something here called a mandolin, which you can adjust, um, you know, how, how thick or thin you're going to slice something. Now, remember, I, I see that Chef Tom is not wrapping his hands. Do you not wrap your hands? <laughs> well, I just, I've, I've done it enough times where hopefully I, I know where I'm getting to the danger zone. <laughs> no, I am, uh, also, I am absolutely respectful of the mandolin. It's one of my favorite kitchen tools, and I recommend it to right. any, any eager chef. 
to get a good right. mend in and to wrap your hands so that because it's like right. a they're also sold uh, with a little bit of a guard where yeah. you know you would you would put it put the guard here and sort of use yeah. that to go up and down but unfortunately that's usually the first thing that gets tossed in the kitchen yeah, but nobody can find kind it kind of awkward you know there's a glove there's also a glove you can buy true yep. Yep. yeah yeah which is yeah we also have yeah i probably should have be using it I, I have our safety cut gloves here but <laughs> So we're well, gonna, uh, we're gonna respect you. No criticism intended. I'm just <laughs> when it comes to sharp blades. Yep, yeah, all good. Uh, so we're gonna steam our potatoes first. We're gonna give them a little bit of a head start. And as you may have noticed, what I did was oil the pan a little bit just to kind of keep them from uh, sticking. So we're just gonna lay them out in no real um, order, I guess. But we're gonna. So what kind of potatoes are you using? Yeah, great question. So we've just got some new potatoes here. Yep. And I know uh, in the recipe, I think it said with, um, you know, a new potato or thin skin, no need, no need to peel it. Right. And we're just gonna maybe lightly uh, salt and pepper these. So the idea of using the potato uh, as a bed for the fish is really to provide a side dish that you don't necessarily see. But it's there so that when you finish eating this wonderful dish, you, you've had a really robust meal. And so we're going to, while those are, uh, while those are cooking, we are going to uh, just maybe start the dressing a little bit. Uh, so we have some lemon juice here. And we're just going to sort of whisk some um, olive oil into that. And let's we'll see so it kind of comes. This sauce is not an emulsion. It's not really like a vinaigrette. It's more of a blend of really bright ingredients that are going to lift the fish. And Pollock is a perfect choice. So it's going to really excite the fish so that you have this wonderful blend of happy flavors to enjoy. Yep. And we sort of uh, just kind of fold some uh, chopped shallots in with that. So Tom, do you use a lot of shallots in your cooking? We do. We, we buy, we use so many that we buy them by the, by the gallon already peeled. Same with oh, the garlic. Wow. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> a service to humanity. Whoa. Because in France, you, you can hardly move without cooking with a shallot. Right. Yes. All right. We do have a question um, from our lovely chat asking, what are some other types of fish besides pollock that you might use instead? Well, I would recommend for this particular sauce, you, you want a non-oily fish in general. You want something more on the delicate side. It can be robust in texture like pollock. So I would use anything from the cod family. So you could use haddock or cod, or we have, you know, there's um, West Coast fish called lingcod, but uh, where you're located, you can get a lot of different white fish. And the larger the flake, of course, the more elegant it is. Uh, you can use flounder. And I would say to people who live some place where there is no daily catch, that even tilapia would work with this recipe. Thank you very much. That's really good information. I gotta look at that. <laughs> yeah. We're adding our uh, pollock now. We gave our potatoes a little bit of a head start. Just gonna lightly salt them, a little pepper. And, and really, in, in my opinion, we, we do this just to bring out the natural flavors. We're not trying to you know, hide any flavors, but we're just trying to enhance the, the natural flavors of the fish. And the other thing about salting those now is that every, when you're cooking a dish, every level of the dish is seasoned. So that when everything comes together, you've got this harmony of flavor and seasoning. So you don't want to forget the one element, uh, you know, to, you don't want to forget to season any part of it. All right. So while that is um, steaming, and steaming, by the way, I mean, it's not, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but you'll notice that um, I've got a cover on here and that's really important because if we, if we let the, the steam escape, we're not really, we are steaming, but you really want to let that steam build up. That's what cooks the fish. And really don't want to let the fish touch the water. Um, otherwise that's, you know, either, you know, boiling or simmering or, you know, whatever else with the fish actually in the liquid. So we want to 
kind of separate and, and leave a bit of space and really you want that steam is what we're after. So when you're thinking about steaming is a wonderful way to cook fish and fish cooks very quickly. So, you know, often I've been asked, well, wouldn't you rather do it in a microwave or, you know, and I always say no, because it doesn't save any time. Fish cooks so quickly, especially something, you know, of these white fish. I mean, you can sort of assume it's going to take about six minutes. It depends on the fish. If it's very, very firm, you could maybe go all the way to eight, but normally it's four to six. So the potatoes are kind, you, you want to, fish is very delicate. It's, you know, you don't want to do anything violent to it. So the potatoes kind of protect it from the heat of the steam. And yet it's cooking in this cloud of heat. So it's all over gentle. Perfect. And there's another, uh, and again, not to kind of deviate too much, but there, as I'm listening to you, and obviously this is the recipe we're talking about steaming. There is another uh, technique, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, um papillote. Uh, yes. that is kind of steaming and kind of wonder if it, you know, certainly not the same kind of thing, but if a recipe like this could be adapted to a, Absolutely. Uh, something in papillote. Yeah, I'll tell you why I don't always do papillote. You know, I, I have taught cooking in France for 20 years. I have a little, well, I really don't have the school now because COVID has made me say goodbye for the moment. But I do have an online cooking platform called Dancing Tomatoes. Dot com and I invite you all to join me there. That is my new direction for teaching cooking, but getting back to papillote, that's cooking in parchment. So it does involve a fair amount of folding and I always would say to my students, now this is like origami and it's also like being in fourth grade because you have to fold, you have to do what the teacher says, you have to fold here, then you have to <laughs> fold over and it's, it always works. It's really fun, but everyone's kind of, thumb. it's like they have five thumbs. So I think, you know, how can I make this simpler for people that's not intimidating, that they don't need a special technique or anything. And I do not want to steam in aluminum foil. If I, uh, there are many reasons. One, aluminum foil is, is not ecological at all, but I also don't like my food to touch it. So if I'm ever called upon where I have to use aluminum foil for papillote, I would first line it with parchment and then you just crimp it over. But Rather stay away from that whole thing. And this steaming technique is really simple, really. Do you That's ever use rutabaga or other veggies aside from potatoes? Oh, you can do lots of different things, but you need to judge um, your vegetable to make sure it's pretty much cooked by the time the fish goes on top. You could do sweet potatoes. Now they'll cook very quickly if they're sliced thin and they would uh, maybe more tend to fall apart. Um, you could do onions. Uh, you could even do, you could thin slice cauliflower or broccoli and put that in there and cook it till it's just about tender, then put the fish on top. So once you, once you start thinking about this, you, you can have a lot of fun with this. Yeah, so as you may notice, we've, we've chopped some herbs that we're going to kind of fold in at the last minute for, just while, the, uh, while the fish is cooking. And the herbs here today, we're using uh, basil, we're using thyme, we're using tarragon. We're using some uh, fresh parsley. And I think one of the things that makes this recipe so delightful is that we're using, you know, fresh herbs. We're not, we're not using dried herbs. You know, I used to use, use dried herb, or herbs or occasionally recommend them until I really dove in headfirst to the world of cooking and realized even in a small apartment in Paris, like where I live right now, I have fresh herbs on the windowsill. Um, and, you know, if all you can do is put a few shallot bulbs in a pot of soil and let them shoot their little green shoots up, you can use those as chives. So there are a million ways, even if you don't have a lot of space, to grow your own fresh herbs. And it's nice. so worth it. Nice. So the fish needs a little bit more time. Uh, but in addition, uh, as you may see, we've got some tomatoes here. Uh, the tomatoes we're using here are from um, Maine, actually. There's a there's a farm up in Maine, and it sounds like you I think it might have been before you went. You, I knew you mentioned earlier that you What's lived there. The farm? Tell me the farm. Uh, so it's called Backyard Farms. It's in Madison, Maine. It's not Elliot Coleman. I'm sorry? It's not uh, Elliot Coleman. I don't believe so. Okay. Oh, this is Backyard Farms. Um, at, one, at one time, it was the, and it's about, oh, I'm going to go back maybe 10 or 12 years old now, the, the, um, the company, but it was. Um, their bread and butter is sort of the tomatoes on the vine. Around here, when you go into the supermarket, 
and you go to the produce section, you have tomatoes on the vine, I would say, you know, 60% of the time, or if not higher, uh, it's, it's going to be their tomatoes. And we get 25 pound boxes of what they call the drops of, you know, tomatoes that just, you know, fell off the vine or whatever, and we're still able to get a great product. Uh, it was the most technologically advanced greenhouse uh, in North America at the, in the day uh, with, you know, reclaiming a lot of the snow melt and rain, part of the irrigation. They have bees That's flying around, amazing. pollinating. I, wow. I love that because, you know, I, I'm out all about seasonal. So they're yeah. playing with the seasons. They're totally um, adapting their product to a non-season. I mean, it's freezing in Maine right now, but there's so yeah, much, absolutely. So much reach, research that's gone on in farming in Maine with all these double sort of double greenhouses that trap air in between the layers and create warmth and the warmth can come from sometimes from the center you know from the earth from the what do they call it um I'll tell you when you speak two languages you do not become smarter because you can't find words in either language but that's fabulous I'm so glad that you're using farm-raised Tomatoes. Yeah, we have a pretty good, uh, you know, um, we have a very good commitment uh, to lo using local sustainable products here at Northeastern. So we're just, so we, uh, talk about, we talk a lot about local and seasonal and I, I sort of run into a wall when I want to use an, a lemon or I want to drink a cup of coffee. Right. Or I want to sip. <laughs> and so You're every right. person has to make their decision about what, what they'll sort of make a compromise on because I don't want to cook without lemons, but I won't right. buy I won't buy a lemon from Peru. I will buy one from Spain because I know it was delivered on a truck, not in an airplane. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you make your decisions and you do the best you can. Sure. Exactly. Especially this time of the year here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you can see that our uh, fish, it's, it's starting to flake. It's starting to you know, sort of break away here. So I'm going to, as best I can here, uh, kind of lift it out. You can see it there. Just going to let it drain. A really a, good uh, way to see the fish is cooked is to get under it with that spatula. And if it, if it starts to break, you, you can see down in it already. Yep. And if it's a little bit undercooked, better to take it away then than to let it overcook. And I think you're setting it on a cutting board, correct? Uh, so this is, I'm sorry if you're not able to, this is just a platter that we uh, oh, just kind of let it, let it sit, you know, give up some of the juices. Because fish will always seep. It will always give up juices after it's cooked. So you always want to put it in a temporary place. Let it give up those juices, which are not interesting juices. They're not flavorful. They add nothing. It's basically like water. Let them give that up because you don't want that in your sauce. And then, you know, after two or three minutes, you can move the fish to the actual dinner plate. Exactly. Yeah, so we're just gonna give our um, potatoes another, another second here. But we're actually going to uh, kind of take these out now, and kind of arrange them on our um, serving platter. Nice, that I'm getting kind of hungry. You know, it's dinner time for me. <laughs> Those are beautiful little potatoes. And where, yeah, where did you say the potatoes come from? So the potatoes are from uh, down in South Dartmouth, Mass. Um, trying to remember the name of the farm as I'm doing this. Um, you can see it on the box. I just can't remember. What. So I think it's amazing that you have so many things available to you to use. And I'm very impressed that you encourage people to do this. Well, it's gotten more and more, like probably like yeah. a lot of places, it's gotten more and more over the last few years. Yeah. And um, the thing about French cuisine, the French have always cooked that way. It's always been all about local, all about seasonal, and every single French city, town, and village has markets where local vendors, local producers come and sell their wares. So I live in Paris. My In my neighborhood, I have... I could go to a market every day, but Monday, of course, no markets on Monday, but at every single market, there is at least one local producer, local being maybe 40 kilometers away and often three or four and often local cheeses, local eggs, 
you name it, chickens, everything. And they're so much tastier than if they come from far away. Plus, all those people get to make a living. So on that point, Tom, I had actually already answered this question, but somebody had asked about our fish and where we would buy that from. Can you talk a little bit about our local partnerships with seafood? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we have um, a lot of our fish that we serve here at, at Northeastern comes from a company called Red's Best. And I could take the rest of the afternoon and talk about Red's, but in the interest of time. So Red's is a company that um, is great because they, um, we here at the university, you know, we serve all kinds of fish, but we're trying to focus, a lot, focus on uh, underutilized species. And back in 2018, we won a uh, food vision prize from the Kendall Foundation uh, that, that was really focusing on underutilized species and actually um, advancing the use of kelp uh, too. And uh, so Reds actually, we get a lot of these, um, you know, we get a lot of our products from Reds. And the things that makes Red special is that they uh, work with uh, small family uh, owned boats. You know, they're not lar sort of large fleets. And what they do is they guarantee uh, their catch, the fisherman's catch. So one of the worries is if I'm a cod fisherman, am I gonna go out and am I gonna catch any cod today? Um, and what Reds has done is taken that, wor taken that worry away from them. They said, you know, we're going to buy whatever you catch. If you're a cod fisherman and you catch monkfish or um, ocean perch or skate or whatever it might be, uh, we're going to buy that from you. And we're going to give you a fair market value uh, and a living wage for that. And the fishermen obviously love that, you know, so there's really no risk, you know, in terms of, you know, am I going to be able to sell it? Am I going to, you know, what, what's the price going to be? Um, and it's great. And ourselves, as well as a lot of other, you know, schools in the area, um, both, you know, universities. And actually I was on a panel with, um, Red's Best just last week, and I, I heard him talk about um, some of the K through 12s, like out in Springfield and some other wow. communities here in Massachusetts, where they're serving this fresh, uh, fresh fish. Unbelievable! That's um, such a gift. You know, you know, that's I. I wrote a book about seafood, and I went fishing with commercial fishermen all over the country in the U.S. One of their big worries was just that: Am I going to be able to survive? So I went to something called a trash fish banquet. Oh, there you go. And using, you know, serving ocean pout and yep. sea robin and all these fabulously underutilized yep. species. Yep. And I'm really, I'm so glad to hear that they're becoming more mainstream, really, with a yeah. company like Reds. Awesome. That looks beautiful. Yeah. What a gorgeous yeah. job you did. Yeah, thank you. And then we're, you know, we just, we have some of our uh, leftover uh, herbs. So we'll just kind of put those around. Looks just so like just, the picture. <laughs> Thank you. But as you said, it just, uh, it's very simple. It takes, doesn't take a lot of time, just using simple, fresh ingredients. Um, and you know, Tom, I don't know if we have time, but we didn't talk about Michel Guerra, who was a chef. This, right. this sauce has to do with him because he took a very old fashioned French sauce based on butter and turned it into this gorgeous tomato herb olive oil, light, light version. And he did that with all foods. He was, he really is known as the king of, I guess we'd call it um, uh, cuisine, um, uh, not cuisine légère, but what was his, what was his thing? I think, was it, was it uh, cuisine mensure? I might be mispronouncing that. Yeah. Well, there he, he was starving us to death because yeah. he put like <laughs> a cherry tomato in the middle of a plate and sprinkled with salt. But he went on, <laughs> cuisine mensure was to get people to eat to eat better, to eat less. Right. And then he went on to transforming and taking these very traditional sauces. This virgin sauce used to be whipped butter mixed with lemon juice and salt. And he said, wait, I can do that with olive oil, tomatoes, basil, fresh herbs, and make it something really wonderful. And we owe him enormous amounts for how he brightened food up. Absolutely. And you can see, to your point, uh, just on the, the when I some of the juice that the fish gave up. I think if I let it sit there a little longer, it would have given up more. Uh, but just to your point, I think that's something that we probably don't want on the on the dinner plate or whatever. It so, doesn't add anything. And let's just say you're making a beurre blanc, which is a butter sauce. And you've got mm -hmm. this beautiful balanced sauce and you put a piece of fish that didn't sit. You set it in the sauce. I mean, your sauce is go going to be watery. So you really mm -hmm. need to, to give it that time to give up its water. All right, so now we're gonna move on, I guess, to the uh, a second recipe. So it is a, uh, is a salad, actually. So I've got my um, heavy skillet here. 
turn it up just a little bit. So it's a salad, but the French call this kind of a salad. It's a salade composé, a composed salad. So it's a meal. And you can either get it as a first course in a cafe or as a main course. And I would say every cafe in the land offers a version of this salad. And it's got, um, I don't know what kind of greens you have there, Tom. Uh, we have some chicory. Okay, because yes, uh, because in France you would get a curly endive, which is not that far from the chicory family. And um, it's sort of frizzy at the end, so it kind of tickles your palate when you eat it. And then you've got bacon, the yep, magic we've got bacon. Some, yep, we've cut them into lardons. Yeah. Lardon, yeah, that's very important, but it's not the main ingredient. The main ingredient <laughs> is chicory. And you fry the bacon and you add vinegar to the bacon in the pan. Then you stand back because you will it will kill your eyes. <laughs> yeah. It kills your eyes. But and, uh, it's a salad dressing for that gorgeous chicory. All right, so and we're gonna start with yeah. uh, so while the bacon is rendering, so we're actually gonna um, take a little bit of um, so we're gonna take some lettuce. Some of the uh, chicory, majority of this. That's beautiful. Yeah, so we can add in a little bit more if we like, but um, we're going to take. So we've taken some of those same shallots, but we've cut them into thin, uh, thin rounds, very papery, as thin as we could get them. So we're going to sprinkle those in. So shallots are a vital ingredient to a salad. And, and we're actually going to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, you know, we're going to add some garlic now. And it, it, this is uh, interesting, I would say, because in the recipe, it you call for a minced or a small dice um, garlic, not a puree, not a, um, so that's what we've done. We've, we've cut it as fine as we can. The reason I asked for that is because I want you in your, when you're eating your salad, I want your teeth to meet a little tiny piece of garlic to get the flavor. And you know, the garlic press, if I could say one thing, I would say, I wish they would all be put in a box in the world and sent somewhere away. <laughs> because they really, really do not do garlic a favor. So it's better really for the flavor and the texture of the garlic to mince it or dice it, or you can even smash it in a mortar and pestle if you need to, to make an aioli, a garlic mayonnaise. Uh, but you will notice the texture in the, when you make this salad, which I hope you all of you will, that you're you're actually getting the sense of the garlic without being overwhelmed. Yeah, so we're, we, we've got that going. We're rendering our bacon. And then there's another component to this dish that's pretty interesting. So it is, uh, so we've cut some, uh, we've, we've taken uh, some baguettes and we've cut them into some small, uh, small pieces. So we're gonna stick them in our oven in the, under the broiler for just a minute. We want them to brown. Hopefully I remember they're in there. <laughs> oh, you know, I was just gonna say, do you have a time? I'll try to remember. Uh, okay. okay, in, in my head. <laughs> Some of the places I've worked where we would make our own croutons, immediately after you make them and put them in the oven, you would start making them again because you knew you were gonna forget them. <laughs> Susan, yeah. can you talk about the drawbacks of the garlic press? Well, I think it's, um, you know, the garlic press extrudes the garlic. So, so it presses on the garlic and garlic has a lot of sugar in it. It has a lot of phenols in it. It has all these components that tend to get blended and lose their edge as the garlic is extruded through the garlic press. So it's not that it becomes something other than garlic, but garlic has such a clean, a vivid flavor to offer and we tamp it down by using a garlic press. I will say it's a probably easier, although I don't think so because you've got to scrape it off the garlic press and get in there. And it's really um, so much better. You get so much more from a garlic clove if, if you chop it. Yeah, so my, um, and I know everybody who probably logged on here and has heard me say this uh, how many times, <laughs> but my favorite kitchen tool is the microplane. Actually, we have it right here, right? Yeah. And I, I actually like to um, grate the garlic. That's a great um, idea. Great yeah, idea. It, you, you really get 100% utilization. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it does get caught on the underside, but you just give it a little yeah. tap and it sort of falls right out. So, Tom, um, do you use a fork to hold it or do you just do it with your hand? No, no, just with my hands, my fingers. Tom is a very brave person. <laughs> okay. Let me just check my. Uh... All right. So, they need a little bit more time. And then what we're gonna what we're gonna do when we take those out, we're actually gonna rub uh, both sides with a clove of garlic, whole clove. And then we have some lovely goat cheese here that we're gonna put on and just kind of put it, put under the broiler, and, um, and make that all nice and, and brown and bubbly. So you can see, just like regular bacon, we're giving up some of the fat. And I get it. Nice and crispy. I do want to say for the team that's here that we are all we're all filming. It smells absolutely delicious in here, I'm and we're salivating. I wondered who was going to get to eat this yummy, yummy, uh, these yummy dishes. And bacon is a huge part of French cuisine. We don't call it bacon; we call it lard. But the pork, the pig, is a very important animal in France, and they truly eat every part of the pig truly from snout to tail. That has been for thousands of years. The Gauls, when they hunted the wild boar, they figured out how to preserve pork because they found a dead wild boar in a salt marsh. It was floating there and it was perfectly preserved and they went, okay, wow. we can preserve meat with salt water. Sausages, bacon, hams. So we have a very long tradition here of fabulous pork. It's relatively inexpensive. Every part of the animal is good from the feet. I mean, we buy pork feet, pork head, pork ears, pork this, that, and the other thing. And in fact, for dancing tomatoes, I'm making a pork pate later on in the week. And it's just a wonderful food, but here it's used as a seasoning. The bacon is a seasoning. So we're gonna rub uh, both sides of the toast with the garlic. Tom, do you know of any good local sources for goat cheese? Um, well, I don't know. We good local sources. Well, there, there are any number of them. Uh, I can't think of the name of a particular farm, but I think if you go to a higher end, you know, sort of cheese shop, um, you know, here in the South End, we have. Um, we have at least one. And the, the, goat cheese, the goat cheese you want is not too firm, not too soft. We get cheeses here that are very three, three to four days old and they're quite almost like a cottage cheese that's held together by itself, you know? And you want something that's more like a week old or a week and a half so that you can cut it in these slices. Or we get these cheeses, I just cut them in half and then it kind of, and you, you put it on the untoasted side of the bread so that you're not really making people bite into a very, very hard piece of baguette, but it's toasty for on one side and then it's kind of gooey and yummy on the other side. Yeah. So we're going to take, we're going to um, leave some, we're going to toast them all, but we're going to leave some without goat cheese. Put those back in. And I think our bacon is talking to us now that it's just about ready. And we also wanna, I think, pay attention to, I know in your recipe, you call that call out that you wanna pay attention to how much fat is left in the bottom of the pan. And yep. that, you know, we, we do want enough, you know, for our, uh, for our salad. So if there, if you do run, if, you're, if you do see that, you know, it didn't give you up quite as much fat, you know, you can add a little bit of olive oil. So you, you basically would like to have three tablespoons of fat yep. for one tablespoon of vinegar. I think that's the proportion here. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm looking at three to one ratio. It's actually three tablespoons of vinegar to three tablespoons of, yeah, of olive oil okay. if you need it. The so idea, we've got, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say, we're gonna add the uh, vinegar that you spoke about. Stand back, look how your eyes, through your eyes. Uh, <laughs> Susan, do you often cook with liver and make it palatable? Interesting question. I was just talking to my daughter about this yesterday. 
I do not often cook with liver, but for the pork pate, I'm taking pork liver and blending it in with the meat. So that's one way to get liver. The French eat a lot of veal liver. And you know, it is very, very good for you. And especially we are quite lucky here to be able to get organic meats and, and um, organ meats. So I'm not opposed to liver. It's just not me. I'm not much of a meat eater in general, but I'm, you know, I know how to cook it and I can make it taste good. Awesome. Yeah, so we've got that, all that oil and vinegar and bacon and fat. You know, a foie gras is liver. So that is a whole other category of liver. I love it. I could eat it a lot more often than I do. Um, it's, it's fattened goose liver or duck liver. So that is a regular, has a regular place on my table. Yeah. Has, has there been much uh, in the news the last few years about uh, foie gras in France? I know here in this country, due to the you know, sort of, I don't want to say inhumane, but the way it's raised, I guess. Um, no. There's been an issue, I guess, in the last few years, and, and in fact, well, you know, banned um, in some states. We do have Brigitte Bardot, who is the head of PETA, the animal rights group. And she does regular, um, you know, regular, um, I would say, what, uh, TV interviews about uh, anti-animal cruelty. But no, we really don't. And it is a vital part of French agriculture to produce foie gras. And I worked on a foie gras farm on and off for six months. And I will tell you, those animals were treated like king and queen of the world. So I don't know. Um, you have to sometimes abstract, I guess. You know, your anthropomorphizing of animals. And the Egyptians, two thousand more than 2,000 years ago, discovered the method for making foie gras. It's been around for a long time. And it keeps a lot of farmers living. Yeah. Susan, do you have recipes for liver in your cookbook or any of your other cookbooks? I do for chicken liver. Yes. Um, in this book, I do not have other than that. In the French Farmhouse Cookbook, I have a couple of different pâtés that use liver. Um, other than that, no, I don't. I would not say it is the theme song of any of my books. Yeah, so I was just uh, hoping to, um, so you can see our toast, um, our un garlic or un goat cheese toasts are uh, are done. Just wanted to give the goat cheese just another minute if we could. Nice. Well, it looks yeah. great. You know, the no. seems, yeah. So, so it so seems to be well coated, and uh, we've got the you know the bacon lardons. We've got some uh, really thin sliced shallots. I did actually, add a little bit of uh, salt and pepper earlier. In France, when you order this salad, you get about that much for one person wow. because it's a meal. So, and it goes, if you want to, you know, usually a, a formule with a plat du jour includes a glass of red wine or white wine if you want. But I would say 90% of the time. So a red wine, a nice simple red wine would be delicious with this. That's beautiful. But you can see, remember the bacon is a seasoning and it's, adding protein to the dish, but it's not an overwhelming part of it. And um, and we add a little bit of salt, but not too much. It depends on the saltiness yeah. of your bacon. Yeah. Beautiful. That is actually something I enjoy about the recipes um, that I've seen is that, that you have them perfectly laid out and then you have the what wine would work best with it. And for people who are of age, it's a beautiful pairing. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I know that, you know, the drinking age in France is younger than in the US. Um, they can drink, kids can drink at 16 with their parents and 18, I mean, outside the home and 18 just on their own. So, and wine is just a part of life. It's not a, you know, I think we make it into something a little scary, but it's really part of a, a meal. It's important to, to serve a glass of wine and you don't always have to know that much. You just have to know what you like and it will probably go with what you're eating. So this looks absolutely beautiful. It smells just as good mm. as it looks. Now, um, actually, you know, just to one more word is you could serve a smaller portion of that salad and then serve the fish and that would be a full moon. Oh, that's, that's wonderful to know. I mean, I think 
unfortunately, we're just going to eat it all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're going to give our, uh, our viewers a quick second to see if there are any more questions that want to come in. I would love to just ask while we wait for those, if there are any more questions, what, just cause I feel like a lot of us are a bit of a Francophile, um, what is probably your favorite and least favorite thing about living and cooking in France? That's a really interesting question. Um, my favorite thing about living in France is pretty much everything, uh, in terms of cooking, I really think there are no better ingredients in the world than what you find here. And you find them easily. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of the reasons the food here is so good. Now, one of my least favorite things about living here is, is sort of banal, but it is true that you can barely move without doing piles of paperwork. So there's always a lot of, uh, a lot of protocol involved in everything you do. And so you have to get used to knowing that if you have to do something, it's going to involve many phone calls, many layers of paperwork, and that you're not going to understand anything. So you just learn to live with it. Or you call a French friend and say, can you help? Friends are definitely needed everywhere. <laughs> So Susan, we're actually, we are so excited that we've had you. These look and smell amazing um, for a few of the people who have reached out to us with their email in the chat. We will be reaching out to you next week um, to uh, coordinate picking up your uh, your copy of, and I'm going to say it wrong, Plat du Jour. Yeah, I know my pronunciation is not as good as yours, <laughs> but we are very excited to cook from them in the future. And thank you so much for bringing a little bit of France to us. Thank you. And thank, thank you to everyone who attended. I appreciate your attention and I hope you'll go home and use the book. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And don't forget to go to Dancing Tomatoes. Thank you.